Good evening. Um, my name is Udi, uh, Udi Gur from Jerusalem. I will be facilitating this talk. Um, we are very excited to have you all. There are many people here with us and in all the other Zoom meetings that we are holding tonight. Um, we want to wish all our uh, Muslim uh, friends uh, Ramadan Karim. Uh, the Ramadan uh, has started today, the Muslim Ramadan. Um, we will be speaking in English. Um, this meeting is overcoming fear through nonviolent action. And uh, with us today, David Shulman and Sami Awad. Uh, if anyone wishes to hear translation to, of this talk to Hebrew, uh, you have a small ball at the bottom of the page with a sign interpretation. You just uh, choose uh, Hebrew. We will be translating this talk to. Um, And we are uh, very thrilled to have you after the 16th time that we are holding the joint Israeli-Palestinian memorial day. And uh, um, uh, because of the corona, we have also the opportunity uh, because most people here, uh, more than 200,000 people have watched today the, the ceremony and we have the, the opportunity to create different encounters, uh, some of them with bereaved people who will be telling their story, some of them with people who will be addressing the topic of uh, fear of uh, trying to bridge the gaps and uh, achieving understanding and peace and compassion. And... Um, I'm an activist uh, in Combatants for Peace. As I said, my name is Udi. And uh, formerly I was the Israeli coordinator of the movement. I'm also a teacher in high school and I'm 42 years old. I have two daughters and I live in Jerusalem. And uh, I know David Shulman personally and Sami Awad and I've had the pleasure of um, learning a lot from them about uh, nonviolence, and I will, I, I will, I would like to say a few words about uh, about each of them. <clears throat> Second. So. Um, David will be uh, David will be our first speaker for um, for tonight. He's an Amorite professor. Um, of the Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem. Um, the languages, literatures, cultures, and history of pre-modern India in his uh, bachelor's years at the Hebrew University, he studied Arabic and Persian before moving south and east into India. He's also a longtime activist in Ta'ayush, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian movement. Ta'ayush means uh, living together. Um, from its first days and with many years of experience in the South Hebron Hills and in recent years also in the Jordan Valley. He has written two books about uh, this activist, uh, activism. One of them is called Bitter Hope. Um, about Ayush. And the question that naturally arise, questions about human freedom, about wickednesses, and about despair and hope. He has three sons and 10 grandchildren. 
and he hopes that they will someday understand what he is doing and maybe even be proud of him. Um, David, hello. Hello, can you hear me? You can unmute yourself. Sorry. Yeah, it's unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. Be well, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'll begin. Um, hello to Sami and Woody, and nice to see everyone. Um, we're, uh, we've been asked to speak about fear. Uh, I thought I would begin with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. He has a famous quote in which he says, um, the enemy is fear. We think the enemy is hate, but it is fear. And he also says, somewhere that there would be no one to frighten you if you refuse to be afraid. I have to say I'm a little ambivalent about that second statement because uh, actually I, I respect fear and I don't think that we can just refuse and violently suppress fear or for that matter any of our feelings. I think fear is something one perhaps has to think about and live with and experience. Um, however, I do agree with another statement of Gandhi's. He says, fear may have its use, but cowardice has none. Um, and, you know, fear, uh, there are different kinds of fear. In a way, maybe we have to pick our fears. Uh, I thought I would talk a few minutes about the kind of things that I encounter uh, regularly in the field. I'm in the Palestinian territories regularly, practically every week, um, and it's been like that for many years. And sometimes uh, there are dangerous situations. We accompany Palestinian shepherds and farmers to their lands. Sometimes we stand between them and very violent settlers, Israeli settlers. Sometimes we also have to protect them from the soldiers and the police. And occasionally we find ourselves in dangerous, dangerous situations. And I have to say, before I say anything else, it, it's gotten worse in the last few months. That the situation in the territories uh, is terrible, even worse than it was. There is a lot of rampant settler violence, which the army and the police are usually unable or unwilling to control. Just in the last couple of weeks, a close friend of mine, Arik Asherman, um, was very brutally attacked. Um, actually, uh, Arik's been attacked many times. Within the last few months, there were several attempts to kill him. And uh, about a week ago, 10 days ago, he was brutally attacked by young settlers. Um, maybe some of you saw it on television because uh, it was filmed. And, uh, you know, I have to say, uh, whenever that happens, uh, he's a member of an organization called the Torah Tzedek. And then whenever this happens, and it happens regularly, then um, the board of Torah Tzedek, uh, of which I'm a member, uh, is convened in an emergency session to try to convince him to be more careful because he finds himself often in situations where he's alone and there are maybe four, maybe 10, maybe 15 settlers, mostly young adolescents who are um, often extremely violent and the fear is that he could be killed. And uh, at these meetings, one tries to persuade Arik that uh, he somehow, he should never go there alone. He has to have people with him. We, we have to take precautions and all of those things. And Arik uh, invariably says, he understands the fear, but if you're going to fight evil, 
or wickedness, you have to be prepared to take the risk. And that's true. He's right about that. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends, uh, many friends, Israeli friends, who have all the right opinions. They think that the occupation is um, obscenity. They, uh, they're in favor of peace. They want to make peace. They may be pro-Palestinian, whatever. But um, just thinking those kinds of thoughts, although it's not a bad thing, it's not enough. And I've lost, lost respect for people who say... Um, that you know they want all of these things but they're not prepared to take the slightest risk sometimes they ask me if i'm not afraid so uh, i just wanted to tell you the kind of response that i have to that question uh, and i can tell you that sometimes i am afraid um, but usually i say to them um, three things First, I say, the thing I'm most afraid of is that this land that we inhabit together, Palestinians and Israelis, will become unlivable. That my grandchildren, all 10 of them, that my grandchildren may not be able to live in this country if things continue along the path that the Israeli government has chosen and the path that we all know leads to more and more violence and more and more hatred. I'm really afraid of that. And that fear dwarfs by far any feeling of fear that I might have that I might be hurt or that, you know, that, this, that somebody else might be hurt if I go into the Palestinian territories. Um, and in fact, I have the sense that if I'm myself not prepared to take the risk, I don't do the little that I can do, it's really very little, but if I don't do that, then I'm colluding with those people who are driving us into an unthinkable hell. Somebody, um, there was an activist, he was, uh, was imprisoned in Burma because he was a human rights activist. He said the definition is he of hell is knowing that you could have helped, but that you did not. So that's one thing. The first thing is that I, there's something that's worse than the everyday fears that we might encounter in the territory. And that's the fear that this situation will be prolonged and intensified and become worse and worse. It's already reached a point that would have been unthinkable 30 years ago, 40 years ago. The second thing I say is that there are many things that are worse than fear. You know, fear, there's all kinds of things that one could say about fear, but there are things that are much worse than fear. For example, giving into it, not doing what one can, not trying to help. If you see somebody suffering, standing by passively like most Israelis do, even Israelis who belong on the left and in the peace camp, not being prepared to take the risk, betraying your own inner nature, because I think, seems to me that the human being inwardly knows what is right and what is wrong. And it's, it's a terrible thing to betray that knowledge, not to fight what is wrong, to give in, to give up, to be silent, those things are all much worse than fear. Shame is worse than fear. Being ashamed that you didn't do what you could do. So that's the second thing I say. And thirdly, I sometimes say um, that thing about fear, because sometimes my friends say to them, they say to me, um, you know, people will say to me, they would come with us into the field and join us in Taayush. But they say um, they're afraid to do it because they're cowards. But then I think to myself, and sometimes I say to them, um, one thing about fear is that it's kind of boring. Life is too precious and too interesting. And the need to act and to be present fully as a full human being, that need is so great that it's terrible to waste that gift on fear. 
I don't like I don't like boredom. I think it's perhaps one of the most terrible of all human sins to bore somebody else. So those are the kinds of things that I say, and I say them also to myself. Uh, there is one other thing I can say, which is that by experience, long experience, um, in a situation which is truly dangerous, when one is being attacked um, violently or in, immediate, or in imminent danger of attack, usually the anticipatory fear that one might have, the fear that you might have in advance, uh, dissipates. And at the actual moment when something is happening, you don't have time to be afraid. There's too many things happening and there are other people that you need to try to help, uh, to take care of, uh, who are in greater need than you are. And usually in my experience, um, the Ta'ayush activists, whatever they might be feeling on a certain level, they're always able to act and do what has to be done in those situations and fear disappears, uh, might come back later afterwards when you remember what was happening and what could have happened, but in the actual moment, it, um, it evaporates and you do what has to be done. Um, maybe that's enough for now as an opening. Udi, what do you think? Okay, yeah. So you brought, um, you bridged the, the, the philosophy of nonviolence, which you are expert in, and uh, experience in the field, uh, in uh, actually uh, using nonviolent methods in order to affect reality. So, um, this is an interesting position. Uh, most people who are activists are, are not uh, such scholars in nonviolence philosophy. And so, that was interesting to hear. Thank you. Um, your connection is maybe a little bit uh, weak, so if you can use hotspot uh, for the... Um, uh for the rest of this talk. Um, I'll see if I can connect the hotspot. Yeah, all right. So thank you, uh, David, for now. And uh, let me introduce uh, Sami Awad. Um, we have two uh, experts of nonviolence here. Today, one Israeli and one Palestinian. Um, Sami uh, Awad is the uh, founder and programs director of the Holy Land Trust, uh, a nonviolent organization located in uh, Bethlehem. He's right. Uh, his, here. Here. his parents are. I'm going to stay here because. Right. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Sami's parents are both Palestinians. His father became a refugee uh, at the age of nine after his father, Sami's uh, grandfather, uh, was killed in, 19, in the 1948 war. Uh, Sami's mother is from the Gaza Strip. Uh, at, at a young age, Sami was an influenced by the teaching of his uncle, which you've heard, whom you've heard in the uh, ceremony, Mubarak Awad the Palestinian activist who promoted nonviolent resistance to the occupation during the first Intifada. Sami holds a doctoral de degree in divinity from the Chicago Theological Seminary, a master's degree in international relations from the American University in Washington, DC, and an undergraduate degree in political science uh, from the University of Kansas. And Sami is engaged in Self and engaging in nonviolence, healing, and transform transformation work, and globally through visiting and speaking in different countries, communities, poli uh, political and re religious organizations, including Combatants for Peace. Um, Sammy is the father of three beautiful girls. T 
tell me if I express. Maybe you should start by uh, saying their names so I don't, I don't uh, pronounce it wrong. But Layal, Larina, and Lorian. Uh, is that right, Sami? You got it. I have a hard time with them too sometimes, so Good. don't worry. <laughs> so you chose the names. So, all right, so we're happy to have you here uh, in this talk. And um, so you also combine the philosophy and uh, the working on the ground. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the aspect of uh, fear also in relation to uh, the event of today, uh, the ceremony, uh, mm -hmm. and in a conflict, uh, how does the nonviolent philosophy and methodology uh, relates to it? Yes. Good. Thank you, Udi, for the invitation. Thank you, David, for your beautiful remarks. And it is so wonderful to be in the space and to see so many beautiful people uh, that I've worked with, uh, struggled with, uh, got to know over the years. Um, yeah, and I'm very thankful for the for choosing the topic of fear as a main topic. I, I think one of the biggest challenges we've had during the whole uh, peace process, during the whole Oslo negotiations, was that this issue of fear and trauma was completely ignored. You know, politicians were trying to simply come up with a political deal. And to be honest, I think both sides were motivated by fear, even in the peace process. So we could talk about peace and nonviolence, but we could even talk about, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about fear in peacemaking, uh, which for me is as, uh, as threatening and as dangerous. Um, but I want to start by just sharing a little story of my own experience. Uh, as many of you heard, uh, my uncle uh, Mubarak uh, tonight. Um, when he started the, the Center for Nonviolence, I was about 12 years old. And the first nonviolent action I ever participated in was during that time, 12 years old. And the action was uh, to plant olive trees uh, in Tqua, in, in uh, which is near Bethlehem, where the settlement of Tekoa was being built and expanding uh, at that time in the early 80s. And... Uh, and one of the statements he said as we were preparing, and it's the first time I met Israeli activists, international activists, uh, all of us came together to help this farming uh, community. And my uncle said that no matter what, no matter what the army does, no matter what settlers do, do not be afraid. You are here for the right cause. You are here for the right reasons. And you are here to plant trees. No matter what happens, just plant your trees. And as soon as we went off the buses and each one carried their little olive tree and we went to plant them, of course, the army came. And I remember the yelling and the shouting and the insults that were happening towards us uh, from the army and that there was scrimmages with the uh, activists there and my uncle was, was there present. And in my mind, I, the only thing I remembered was what my uncle was saying. You are here to plant trees. Do not be afraid. And then for me, that action really did not just introduce me to nonviolence. It introduced me to what since then I have been uh, putting a word parallel to nonviolence, which is empowerment. When you are engaging in nonviolence, if it's in personal conflict or in collective conflict, you are empowering yourself and your communities to stand up against violence and to stand up against injustice. And for me, uh, empowerment uh, as the main thing, and this is what David was talking about, is empowerment over fear. You cannot be, you should not be afraid when you are engaging in actions and activities that aim for justice, that aim for peace, that aims for creating a better future for the uh, generations uh, to come. And a big part of the work we do uh, when we train people in nonviolence is to address this issue. We, we do talk about uh, fear as, as many people have, fear for loss of life in nonviolent actions. Uh, one thing we all know very well is 
that you being nonviolent, it doesn't mean the oppressor will respond in like. The, the oppressor actually uh, does not like you when you engage in nonviolence, and the oppressor will try to suppress nonviolence. And we saw this very much during the first intifada, the first uprising uh, that led to the deportation of my uncle, who was known as a nonviolent activist. This is how nonviolence actually threatens uh, the, the oppressor. And, and so for us, the work that we need to do continuously is, is to understand that fear might arise, but we do have to address it. And we cannot let fear be the motivation that stops us uh, from engaging. And, and this goes next to the point that I wanted to, to mention is, is when fear is not just connected to my physical well-being in an action, but when fear becomes my motivation to engage in action. And, and what do I mean by this? Um, one of the things that we have seen uh, and realized over the years uh, in our work is to really begin to ask what motivates people to engage in, in activism. Uh, and, and sadly, I would say that a lot of people are actually motivated by fear in their engagement of act in, in activism. Uh, they are afraid of the unknown that might come. Uh, they are afraid of me as a Palestinian. Uh, we have many, many Israelis and we've done work on this that, that are motivated by fear. Uh, if we don't reach a solution, if we don't reach an agreement, then one day those Palestinians, those Arabs, will commit violence against us. Uh, they will become demographically more than us. So we need to reach a solution uh, very quickly because we are afraid. Now, fear can be an initial uh, catalyst, uh, initial trigger. But, uh, but I think as activists who really, really want to engage in real peace work, one of the things we need to do is to address the fear that is within us and to really ask, where does this fear come from? So un unlike, again, physical threat, which is which instinctively gives me fear and, and the need to respond, and, and of course, people can be very well trained to address this, uh, there is the narrative of fear that we have all inherited that has shaped us and shaped our identities as peace activists and that needs to be addressed as well. And this is where I feel a lot of the work we do, and I'm so happy to see some participants here who are taking a course with us, which is about collective trauma healing and addressing fear. Addressing, in, in a sense, as celebrating uh, Pesach now, the liberation of the slavery from fear that motivates so many of us. And we have to bring this uh, to an end. And so, Parallel, uh, what we do as an organization, as we engage in nonviolent activism and resistance and train people to address fear in the action itself, how to deal with fear, how to respond to the, the desire of the other side to motivate you into fear and to escape and to run away and to threaten you so that you will never come again. Uh, we still need to go a level deeper and address how the collective trauma of fear also motivates us to engage in peace work. When I want to engage in peace work with Israelis, I, I don't want this to be motivated by fear of each other. I want this to be motivated by our real desire to actually live together, to, to build real peace together, to build community together. Um, we could easily reach a peace process, I think, and they almost did that. But if the peace process was going to be uh, a peace process that real uh, and emotional and intellectual and identity walls were going to be built between the two sides, then what is this peace that we are talking about? Uh, this is, and I love how David started, this, this is a land we all belong to. This is a land that we love. And this is a land that we should not be afraid of each other to live in it. And so my encouragement is for this uh, development of, of activism 
that is really motivated by a sense of collective justice, uh, that is really motivated by our desire to see each other treat equally in this land. Uh, and dare I say, even motivated by love that we need to have for each other as part of the human family that lives uh, on this land, uh, in this part of the world. And so I, I will end by saying again, to work on the two levels, to always encourage yourself to stand up for justice, no matter what the situation is. Those few people who stood for justice many, many years ago, if it was for women's rights, if it was for African-American or black rights around the world, for minority rights, it took a small group of people that stood for these things. And, and those people were able to address fear. And because of them, we see how the world has changed. Uh, and so do not be afraid if you real, if you feel motivated to stand uh, for justice. And the second thing is to continuously address that collective narrative that we are born in that says we have to fear the other because of our past experiences. What happened to us uh, in the past might happen to us again. These narratives need to stop and, and to end. Um, one person I would, I would love to mention uh, tonight, uh, and, and she was a motivation for many, many people around the world. She passed uh, on uh, two days ago, uh, Ladona Allard. Uh, she is uh, an indigenous First Nations uh, woman, uh, lives in the United States. And uh, if many people here remember Standing Rock and the movement that happened there, uh, St Standing Rock happened in her backyard. She started Standing Rock. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I love her because as a woman who suffered so much in her life, uh, health, family issues, community issues, oppression all the time, she stood up without fear and said, this pipeline that was going to break their land and their sacred space has to stop. And, uh, and I just want to honor her for her life and her experience in this space. And uh, yeah, and maybe we all learn from LaDonna where she was never motivated by fear, but full compassion and love uh, for everyone. Thank you, Sami, um, for all of what you said. I, I think, uh, you teach us something important that um, dealing with your fear from the other side in a situation of a conflict is deeply connected to humanizing it, which is the opposite of what happens in a conflict that we dehumanize the other side. So is this also true for the, the, this specific soldier who, are, who is now uh, threatening you or the settler that is uh, someone from the other side who is violent towards you, can you humanize him in order to not be afraid of him? Um, definitely. Uh, I, I think uh, the demonizing happens both ways. Uh, and we see this uh, from the oppressed and from the oppressor where demonizing and dehumanizing happens. For me as an activist, I need to understand uh, at the core of who we are as humans, no matter what we believe in, if it was uh, creation or evolution, in our core, we are good. We are born good. Uh, we are born to be communal. We are born to have compassion and care for each other. Uh, and then this soldier was a child once, and this child grew up and experienced something, either through education, indoctrination, or, or, a, or an experience uh, that an action that might have happened around him mm -hmm. and, and that motivates them and, and of course guided by institutions and establishments that, that feed on fear uh, that soldier ended up being in the army or that child be, ended up being in the army and was mm -hmm. told and, and I was an ex and I saw this experience when I went to Auschwitz I heard Israeli teachers tell Israeli, Israeli children in Auschwitz and Bergenau that you know the Holocaust is not over and if the Palestinians have an opportunity they'll do to you what the Nazis did to your ancestors 
or everybody hates us. Everybody wants to destroy us. And this is why we have to be strong. And this is why we have to protect ourselves. And the only way to do that is through military might. Uh, this is a narrative. And this is a narrative that is real, of course, uh, and we have to address it. So when I see, when I came back from the Auschwitz experience, I actually had more compassion for the Israeli soldiers that were standing at the checkpoints or in these demonstrations, because in their mind, true or false, it doesn't matter, but in their perception, I am a potential threat to them. This is what they have learned. This is what they were taught. Nobody does it just out of this, or let's say very few people will do it just out of pure hatred for, for humans. Um, and so for, for me, this is why in our work, it became very important to bring the work of collective trauma healing into activism as well, not, not to separate the two. I cannot be a nonviolent activist if I'm motivated by fear or hatred, you know, not, not to physically hate you, hurt you, but if I still hate you, what is the point of my nonviolence? And this is why we were talking about nonviolence is a way of life. It is not just a tactic to be used to achieve a goal. And then if I can achieve that same goal through violence or use violence in, the, in another sense, uh, this, is, this is the importance of nonviolent activism. Okay, thank you. So uh, we will have questions in a minute. Um, uh, just technically, I want to say, yeah, I see someone is raising his hand. Uh, because we are so many people here, we will use the chat for questions. Okay, so in, in two or three minutes, you can think about your question. Please phrase it shortly. And to whom would you like to the question to be addressed? And we will pick from the questions in the chat. And... Um, um, and we will, uh, I will. I will read the questions to you, to the uh, to David or Sami or both of them. Um, I would just like to add my little story while people are writing the uh, the chat. Only me can uh, can write the only the hosts of the of the this talk can read the chat. So um, okay. Um, but when I visited a few years ago, I visited New York uh, with my friend from Combatants for Peace, Raya de Ladar, and we were uh, 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 we were sent from Combatants for Peace to receive an FOR award. And I met there the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, himself a professor of nonviolence uh, in the United States. And uh, I asked him, how can we how can we, and he met Arafat in the past, uh, and I asked him, how can we um, defeat the occupation and the, and, the, and the violence, and how can we win? And he said, nonviolence is not about winning or losing. It's about learning how to live uh, in, uh, Live along uh, alongside with your enemy We're in in uh, balance in balance. Um, so this is interesting also in regards to fear. But we have many questions already, so I will shut up and I will ask you these questions. Um, first one uh, to Sami uh, Andre. Andre is your name. Will you support a global? movement of nonviolence because uh, Andre has uh, has written a lot in the chat about his movement of nonviolence and uh, I, I want to say I think I'm part of your movement Andre already <laughs> <laughs> so yes <laughs> thank you okay so um, you want yeah Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I can't find his name, uh, the name of the of the movement, but uh, maybe we will find it. Um, I'm not sure to whom the question is addressed. What do you think about boycotting Israel in cultural, academic, and other realms? I, I guess this is. Um, 
maybe to both of you. Um, which one would, would like to respond to the, uh, the, um, the idea of boycott as a, as a nonviolent uh, tool of struggle? I can say a few words about it. Um, I should say that I've, I've never managed to bring myself to sign on to any of the um, BDS petitions, statements, or anything like that. Not because I think that their ultimate vision is wrong, I don't know about that, but because there's something in the tonality of their documents and petitions and so on, which I find um, unbearable. Um, I, feel, I feel a lot of it is motivated by, by hatred. Um, there are other various instrumental reasons that I feel that I can't sign on to the boycott. For one thing, it's been incredibly ineffectual, and I think ineffectual politics are not so great. But above all, the, you know, it's something that, that I think came out of what uh, Sammy said just a few minutes ago, very uh, eloquently, about the grounds for action, for nonviolent political action. The ground for action should be love or compassion, not hate. And in fact, I think it's an empirical discovery. All of us have noticed this in the field that uh, believe it or not, and despite everything, love and compassion are actually much, much stronger than fear and also stronger than hate. You might not think that would be the case actually, especially when you see somebody coming at you with hate, but in fact, it's true. And I think that the ground for action, the reason to act, it has to come from some place of some kind of profound um, shared uh, acceptance of the other and some feeling of compassion and love. I, I want to say that I used to feel, I used to feel when I first began work in Irish, I felt hatred towards Israeli settlers. And that was mostly because when I encountered them in the field, they tended to be really terrible, often violent, and all kinds of other things. But that feeling of hatred um, disappeared spontaneously over time. And I think it's because the nature of this, that kind of um, nonviolent protest, nonviolent action, and the sense of freedom that emerges from it, freedom in the person who's prepared, prepared to say no, stand up and say no, that feeling is incompatible, incompatible with hatred. Sami, would you like to add? Thank you, David. Um, this question was addressed to both of you. Yeah, so I'll add, uh, thank you, David, for this. Uh, when, when you look into boycott, uh, boycott is a nonviolent action. Uh, I mean, there is no question about it. And boycott as a tactic has been used and has been successful in many, many experiences of resistance around the world, uh, not just on national levels, but economic, social issues. Boycott works. Uh, and, and for me and the organization I work with, uh, we have engaged and we have promoted uh, boycott uh, when the Second Intifada first started, we led a movement uh, nationally uh, to boycott Israeli products, especially Tipozina. I don't think anybody drinks it anyway today. <laughs> uh, but, but the idea, and it was actually during Ramadan, we launched a, a national campaign. Boycott at least one type of drink that is really not even good for you to start with. And, and my uncle, as he mentioned also in his speech, uh, and during the 80s, engaged in boycott as well. Uh, so, so when we look at it, I think non, uh, boycott, divestment, and sanction are legitimate tactics of nonviolent activism. Uh, where I fully agree with David is really asking again, what is the motivation behind it? What is the tactic that is used? And how boycott like any other tactic 
uh, cannot be just a broad stroke. Uh, it has to be part of a comprehensive strategy of engagement. When we, for example, talk about nonviolence, the, one of the key components of nonviolence is not the action that you do. Uh, the key component of nonviolence is how you pull power away from the system and the structure of oppression. If it was an authoritarian government, a dictator, or an occupation. In a sense, if we need to understand the only thing that actually maintains the occupation the way it is, is the either the support of or the lack of engagement of people to say to the powers that be, enough is enough. We as activists do this, but how many people, how many Israelis actually are doing this continuously? So when the powers in control begin to feel the threat that power that is given to them by the people is pulling away, this creates the change. And so when we look into boycott, we have to ask the question, how has the boycott motivated more Israelis to begin to say no to their oppressive government? Yes or no? And it's not about negating boycott. I think boycott, uh, the, the BDS movement, uh, needs to readdress its motivation. Real work needs to happen in terms of asking is it coming from hatred, and resentment, or fear, uh, or a real desire to make peace, a real desire to end occupation for justice or for peace? Uh, and, uh, and, and again, to, to retweak it and to move with the, with, and, and to, yeah, this is the point, to redesign it based on what is happening to achieve these goals. If I just want to say boycott everything Israel, that's not going to work. For me, communicating, engaging, talking with Israelis is a key part of activism that needs to continue. And so there is this, this movement to ask what to boycott, what not to boycott, when to boycott, and how do we redesign the BDS movement continuously to achieve the goals that we all seek. Um... There are many comments here, many questions. Uh, sadly, I cannot read them all. Uh, but uh, uh, so many people said thank you. Just they just said thank you for your inspiring uh, for these inspiring things that you said. Um, someone has asked, uh, "What gives you strength uh, in your struggles?" Uh, which one would, would want to go first? <laughs> uh, I mean, the simple answer is what other choice do I have? Uh, I, I think for us, and then this has been the, the, like the theme also from the beginning with David's opening, is, is we do this for us and we do this for others and we do this for the gener generations to come. And, and so, yes, uh, the hope and the strength is always found in new people that are joining the movement and people begin to question the systems of oppression that exist and new ideas and new visions emerging as well. Uh, seeing uh, the movement of women activism grow, seeing a young generation that is also getting sick of this reality that we live in and to say they want something different. Uh, thinking beyond Oslo, beyond the two-state solution, the next generation, I see my daughters, how they are thinking. Uh, you know, the, those old school systems are going to collapse for the generations to come. And I think what we are doing, if we cannot do it in our lifetime, at least we are clearing the way, ushering the way for that generation to, to have a better life. I think I can answer that question. Uh, yes. about what gives me strength and keeps me going. Um, the simple short answer is that uh, I meet people like Sami Awad. I meet people um, in the field who are absolutely splendid human beings um, doing the right thing, the best thing that they can do against impossible odds in most cases. And um, there's immense comfort in that. And so although uh, if I look at the Israeli population, I see most of it kind of passive. Um, 
and un, perhaps even indifferent to the suffering that is happening just a few kilometers away. I also think that there's rather a high density of extraordinary people who are prepared to resist and to protest and to take the risk and so on. Um, they're wonderful, wonderful people. And of course, the other thing is that once, um, once you begin to work uh, uh, in, these, uh, in these conditions, you become very uh, closely committed to the people that you meet there, the Palestinian shepherds and farmers and so on. Some of these people are now very close friends. And um, there's absolutely no way that I could possibly even think of like walking away from doing what I could to be with them in their moments of need. Um, and there is strength in that. There's a tremendous strength in the uh, shared camaraderie. And there's also a certain strength in the truth. The antidote to fear, I think, is truth. Speaking the truth and acting the truth. Truth will dispel fear if you are really prepared to give yourself to it. Um, that might have been a good comment to finish uh, this talk with, but we have so many more questions. Um, I have to add at least one or two. Um, I, I want to say, Udi, I'm getting a lot yes. of um, like questions privately. I'm not able to answer, so I, I'm more than happy to share my email if people want to to communicate after. If you want to, ah, do that. so um, yeah, sure. So you, you can write me. Um, uh, you can give me the uh, your email. I can put it on the uh, on the chat no. and. The V the same if people want to address you personally. Um, so I'm not sure. Can you write in the? T I'm not sure you can write so that everyone sees. Ah, you can. Okay. I think I just. Can everyone so. sees. Can everyone see uh, Sami's uh, email? Sami at holylandtrust.org. So, um, because we cannot read all the questions and. Um, I think David can also, can you do that, David? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, great, thanks. So uh, there is another question that I would like to read. Um, you know, research, research is about uh, nonviolent, uh, about nonviolence in, in general. If you're interested in nonviolence, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to all our uh, guests, here, I would recommend the, the film A Force More Powerful, uh, which is uh, a documentary about nonviolent struggles around the world. And the fact is that researchers show that they are much more successful than violent struggles. And um, so they achieve more success in the long run. But I'm, I'm saying this because someone asks here in the chat, uh, how can or can nonviolence overcome the institutionalized violence like army uh, or political violence uh, or how can nonviolence? Usually I think at least in Israel, Palestine, but I think in many parts of the world, uh, Burma to take uh, um, a very sad uh, uh, current example. Uh, the, the feeling is that you are dealing with uh, forces so much stronger than you, right? So uh, you are physically or um, much, much weaker. So how can you um, affect or how can you overcome or how can you live in balance uh, with your uh, enemy or opponent? Um, if I may, there's another quotation of Gandhi who addresses this question. He described the normal trajectory of such struggles like his. He said, first they ignore you, then they fight you, then you win. 
in the middle there is also like uh, then first they ignore you then they laugh at you and yeah then they fight you so you say you should not give up that's one that's one answer to that question should be you know first of all i dedicated. think I, say, I i would want to say uh one of course wants to win. I mean, we're in this struggle because we want to bring change. But that's not the only thing we think about. There's something to be said for doing the right thing, acting without thinking too much and certainly not at every moment about how you're doing and if you're succeeding and if it's really bringing about the change. Because um, first of all, the, um, how should I say it? The reverberation of, a, of an ethical act carried out uh, honestly is something incalculable. You don't know what the effect of it is going to be. And secondly, you do it because it's the right thing to do. Not that we are indifferent to the results, we're not. But doing the right thing is in itself a kind of reward. Sami? Yeah, I mean, I would say, uh, to respond to the question, I would also say, one thing we all know, nonviolence is not a magic stick. So it's not like a magic potion formula, you, you do it. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of dedication. And then you read that more nonviolent uh, actions lead to success than violent. But it's not to say that all nonviolent actions lead to success. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the core of nonviolence, as I think I shared before, which is, a, even when we look at armies, what are armies made of? It's human beings. You pull human beings and convince them to get out of the tanks, these tanks will rust, they will have nothing. You convince human beings by giving them something better, not fear to motivate them to carry guns, these guns will become nothing, just metal to throw away. And so yes, I believe that, that it can be, and I think this is, the, the heart and the dream of every true nonviolent activism is to see a world where, as my friend Michael Beer would say, arms are meant for hugging, not for shooting. <laughs> uh, so, so it is possible, in theory, it is possible to do it and to work on it. It's going to take a lot of effort. But again, it is the fear that motivates these people to join armies to protect an illusion of a narrative that has been inherited to them that is being manipulated by the establishment to tell them your survival depends on you carrying a gun and shooting at somebody. We need to change the narrative through the healing work and we need to engage in nonviolent activism to expose the injustice to even those who are engaging in it. I've, yeah. I've been in protests, and I think Udi, you, and I'm sure David as well, where soldiers start crying after they see and they realize what they are doing. I've seen soldiers being pulled out of the line when they began to engage with us and talk with us because they understood that something is wrong. But their commanders would not allow that to happen. And then, so mm -hmm. yes, it takes a lot of work, but it is possible. Okay. Um, we have to conclude this, uh, but uh, we are getting so many responses and questions, and I think now you can see some of them. Uh, and we will wait before we uh, close this uh, chat so that you can find the uh, email addresses of David and Sami and write to them. This meeting will, is also recorded and you can rewatch it. Uh, through our website after we upload it. Um, I want to say first thank you for Sami and David for this talk. And uh, I want to thank uh, Itamar, our translator, and uh, Shelly, our technical uh, manager. And I want to also, uh, more, than, more than all, uh, thank you for joining us to the uh, Israeli-Palestinian Memorial Day ceremony, and we'll see you next year, and hopefully uh, in a better reality. Thank you Thank very you. much, and a good night. Thank you, everybody.